Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right, I'm sitting here with Leah Rubashkin. Welcome, Leah. Thank you. So you and I met about three or so years ago. Um, you reached out, said you had heard, I think at the time I was doing webinars, it was before the podcast was more formal. Does that make sense? Either, either. I've definitely heard your content. I'd been listening for a while. Um, I had two children at the time, and um, recovering from sex and porn addiction was very relevant to my life. Um, and I took in your content, and it started making shifts um, in my own um, challenges and struggles, and it kind of flipped um, the experience that I was having on its head. Um, when I got married, um, and first started the journey with Avi, um, my husband, with mm -hmm. um, healing from sex addiction, uh, there was so much shame. Him healing from sex addiction. So, sorry? Him healing from sex Him addiction. Him healing from okay, sex addiction. Okay, because what you're saying, it isn't clear. Um, there was so much shame from him and from me. And when I heard you speak, it was a new, there was a, new, a newness, a, t a new tone to it. And um, eventually, I found the courage um, to get your number and reach out to you. Um, and you took the time to understand what was going on in my life, in my marriage, um, and offered the opportunity for my husband to reach out to you. Um, and he did. Um, after he spoke to you, we were living in Coconut Grove, Florida at mm -hmm. the time. I remember him walking in the door and him making a brazen comment about this world that he struggles with. Um, and my heart like got stronger from hearing those words. But when I, when I told the CSAT therapist about it, she freaked out. Like her reaction was like, where's the sensitivity to the wife? Like, how does he say something so bold? What did he say? He was, I won't use his words, right. um, but he was very open and very honest about his interaction with women and, um, and his addiction process. And she was it after speaking with me right after. But you already knew about his addiction. Yes. Before. Yes. But there was a different level of the openness. Yes. In talking to you and in the conversation that he had, um, he owned he owned his um, his story. He owned what he was going through and he put it on the table between us. And my heart sank because. I can finally work was with sang it. Or sank? Sang. 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 Okay. It, it, it rejoiced right. because. Um, I needed, you need honesty to heal. And as hard as it was to hear what he said, which was what my therapist was like shocked, like how can a, a wife bear to hear those words? Um, where's the stability in that? Like go heal on the side and come back to her. But for me, um, as long as there was honesty, there was a path forward. And um, yeah, that was my, my, um, my reaching out to you. And from there, his connection to you and you guided him in his recovery process, and um... yeah. So I, I do remember something about our, our call. So one thing I remember you asking me was, um, you said your husband had been in recovery for a number of years. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned the year five, the number five years, or sober for five years, something like that. Mm -hmm. But he still spoke about or related to his addiction with shame. Yes. And you didn't hear that from. Yes. From me. Exactly. Right. So just to, um, I'll go with a little bit of tangent, then I'll bring it back. So I don't know if this is what shifted my relationship with shame. There was probably a couple of things around sex addiction. Number one, my overall position is that the, the lock on the door of sex addiction, what makes it so tough for so many of us to get out of it, is the shame. Yeah. So you have the desire that gets us into the desire, the pleasure seeking, like that aspect of it gets us in the prison, mm -hmm. but what locks the door of the prison is the shame. Yeah. Now it's very, so to me today, I see the healing process as um, healing from the shame. That's not the same as shameless. Right? Shameless is 
also rooted in shame. So it could it could be subtle the differences, and one can look like the other. Something that's shame free can look like shamelessness. Something mm -hmm. that's shameless can look like shame free. So it could look similar, but it's really about where it's coming from. It's just not carrying a relationship with sexuality still with with so much shame. But I, what I did want to say was that you know a lot of people met, make comments to me about my um, openness on the subject, but where it actually came from, in my case, like the real comfort to do it was from my wife. Even though there were aspects already where I was talking about child sex abuse, I had done that for several years already before I spoke about my porn addiction. But I remember my wife coming home from dinner once and she said, I hope you don't mind, but I was at dinner and one of my friends were talking about the fact that her um, husband was either using porn or cheated on her. And I shared our story with her as a way to give um, some hope. So, should I, so I said, no, I don't mind at all. First of all, it's, it's your story. And she said, is it strange that I'm proud? Like that you're a, uh, <laughs> that you're a um, like recovering or recovered sex addict. And that thought and that feeling that she was actually proud of it, it was something that she didn't hide. She didn't hide from her friend. She didn't hide in general. Like I heard her once say, I feel safer with my husband than the average woman probably does with their husband who's not a sex addict because anyone can can yeah. end up you know going astray and knowing that he has you know a sponsor related to this and he's focused on this and this is an area of his life that he takes serious gives me more confidence than probably most women have in their in their marriage so so in my um off of that the light that your wife um, shined on you or created with you was what I think I heard in those webinars or in the, the podcasts and at a certain point I flipped the scenario in my head that um, I'm not enough and that's why he's um, you know in this using um, porn or other women or um, the lacking and the shame that I had or the lacking and the shame that he had to this man's in recovery for years he is Every single day, he comes back to this topic and says, for the next 24 hours, God, grant me the strength to get through this challenge. Like, this is, this is courage. This is a warrior looking a challenge in the eye, not knowing when it's going to go away, if this is his destiny for the rest of his life, because that's kind of what the 12 steps tells you and shows you, and committed to this journey. Like, he's someone that I have deep deep respect for regardless of whether or not this marriage could go forward and you know blossom and turn into something i was able to separate it and say like as a friend if this man was my friend i'm in awe of the way he approaches the challenge that god gave him um and i think once those that those thought processes found its way into my heart and i that turned into emotion and that turned into the way i was treating him um those were probably some of the the powerful um, remedies to heal him from, you know, the prison of shame that locks right. you in, the shackles. Um, I, I actually, you know, if we bring in um, the mystical element and the energies, I think shame is a klipa. Like it's one of the fiercest tools that the klipa, the klipa uses um, to keep us locked in a specific um, chapter of our lives. They, and there's ways to get out of it. It's namely compassion, pride, um, joy. Curiosity. Curiosity, exactly. Where did speaking, this come from? Sharing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the... Um, I mean, shame tells us, and I think it's one of its main tricks, for sure. You know, agree, like the devil has certain tools that it's allowed to operate in the world with, yeah. and shame is certainly one of its most powerful and effective tools to, to bring us down. One mistake and someone can can um the rest of their life can turn into can turn from that one mistake and i got on the scale of emotions i mean it's right before suicide like it's just yeah. right before um that's it and sexual shame is like has a lot there but what's interesting about shame is that it tells us the lie it tells us is that if anyone knew this about us they wouldn't want to connect to us and that thing that it's saying it about is the thing that s people are actually able to connect to us over. Right. Many more people have connected with me over my story than anything That's else. Right. Exactly yeah. what, what it told me was exactly the opposite of what in fact happened and what in fact is true.
Yeah, I think, um, you know, in the, the idea of like wherever there's a bright light, a lot of darkness will come and follow. Like this is like a mean tenant in Hasidus. Um, the thing we're most challenged with is probably most connected to our soul's mission here, which probably means there's a lot of light there and a lot of darkness will come and try to keep us immobilized around that, mm -hmm. around that um, arena for as long as it can until you rise up and you put yourself out there and you ask for help because there's, there's where I think we're living in a time where there is medicine for everything. Um, and we're not here to struggle endlessly. We're here to walk our way out of the struggles. Um, when I made that phone call to you, I never knew that I would, you know, be a part of taking this relationship. I loved Avi and he loved me, but like from that place, what we have today, um, I told my friend, um, she came over the other day, I said, I'm, I'm living in the marriage that's going to prove the disease model of addiction on its head. Like, You're going to prove it wrong. I'm going to disprove, exactly. Right. This marriage is going to prove that the disease model is a false, you know, maybe it's true for some, but there's another truth here. And that truth is that when you hear, when you heal, like um, you, you, you once said that addiction is like an iceberg. Like there's the addiction yeah. on the top and then there's the loneliness, lack of worthiness, um, defensive, all the yeah. other, you know, unhealed wounds from childhood. Or when you heal those things, there's no longer a need for that. Um, for that addiction, for that coping mechanism to soothe you. Um, and yeah, we don't have to, we're, we're not here to live with this challenge and there's, there's ways out of it. Right. That was one of the, I remember the phone call with Avi as well. And, you know, it struck me that he had a, like a lot of heaviness around his addiction still, you know, mm -hmm. and his recovery process. And, you know, I'm doing this and I have to do that and I have to do this and I have to do that. And so much of, uh, my message at the time, and the reason I started talking publicly at the beginning of the pandemic was because I had this realization that those who are recovering from addiction are much better prepared to deal with these changes that are happening in the world. So there was a lot of pride that I was coming at it mm -hmm. with. It was like, hey, um, all these tools that I learned in recovery are suddenly helping me deal with the dramatic changes from within the pandemic. And I'm saying, all of us who were kind of in the corners of church basements or other, um, you know, places that most people don't go to because, oh, there's recovering addicts, we have a lot to offer, and there's a message that could be that could and should be shared. And that's a lot of what I tried to impart on, uh, on Avi in that conversation, and also around, um, I remember him using the word lust over and over again, a lusting and this and that. I'm like, 12 this Steps is like, loves it. Some, some programs at 12 um, yeah. Steps, not all. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, this is a ghost. Like, you can fight this forever. What does lust mean? Are yeah. we supposed to hate our sex drive? The whole thing doesn't make any sense. You can beat yourself up till the, till the end of time. Pick an action you don't want to do. Right. Take that off the table and then embrace the rest. The idea is healthy sexuality. The idea is reconnecting with it in a positive way, not to, to have this heaviness associated with it forever. Um, I, uh, I did a ayahuasca ceremony and I was on a integration call with someone and I like uncomfortably asked him, um, does everyone receive like a lot of like information or downloads around sexuality? Because like that, that was a big part of what I was being, um, shown and healed and whatever, you know, whatever that realm is. And he told me, whoever, whoever, whoever that message is pertinent to, they're the ones that receive it. Like, just lean in, you know, right. like uh, you're approaching it. Like, um, at a certain point, I realized that with um, m marrying someone who was going to recover, who was going to go on this journey and my own childhood experience of being sexually abused, God was showing me like this is a topic that you're going to spend a lot of time on and there's going to be um, a very important mission for you in this space and it was kind of like the conversation you had with avi was like healthy sexuality is the goal it's not keep away from this don't do this it's there's this giant power in our life it's our life force energy and learn about it and harness that power because there's nothing more powerful Right. And, and I think that's why there's so much fear and that's why there's so much um, dark energy pulling it into church basements, pulling it onto advertisements, pulling it wherever it's going. But if, if you take a look back and you realize you're not a victim to this madness, you're sent here because you're going to reveal its glory. You're going to you're going to 
actually put the glory back. You're going to bring it back to its rightful place here. Do you feel like that's some of your uh, message and purpose? Around uh, I'm accepting that. That That's what um, I'm being shown. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so before we go there and also to your story about um, sexual abuse, which you referenced, because in that one kind of statement you referenced psychedelics, sexual abuse, mm. <laughs> right, a, l- a lot of different things. So it's a lot of different places to, to go. But before then, just in terms of um, how you were able to process your husband's struggles with pornography or, you know, wherever it went to um, in the umbrella of sex addiction, but how you were able to process that in a way that allowed you to keep the marriage together. Meaning, how did you not take it personally? Or you did? I did. I definitely did. How I, are you not now? I, I lived in just, I'll just um, take a minute to say that as a wife who found herself in this situation, it was, it was hell. It was a dark, dark pit. You know, like they talk about um, Yosef Atzadik's pit. I didn't tell anyone for the first two or three years of my marriage that this was going on. So there's not a, a mother. Lot of shame there as well. I was gripped by shame, okay, personal so what was shame. That? Yeah, what was that? That if I would be X, Y, and Z, this wouldn't be happening in my marriage. I'm not what's enough. X, what's Y, what's Z? Um, if I would look a certain way, if I would be blessed, you know, to. Um, be a certain type of person if i um if i were more of what this um unattainable woman can be or is then i wouldn't have this um this challenge i mean challenge is putting it mildly right so the thought was Right, that the reason he's going, he's watching porn is because you are not enough. Right, I'm lacking in a big way. In some way. way. Yeah. Right, right. usually in some thought physically. Yeah, right. definitely. Right, you certainly don't look the way 200 women can look. Meaning in porn, you can look at hundreds of women at the same well, time. I, I, you know, I didn't know you what it is. what I meant by that, right? Yeah, I didn't. Right. It's like the variety that men often crave is impossible for one person to look like. And also the thing that they're craving is never going to be satiated, which Correct. is why the porn industry is the successful you know, market that it is. It's impossible, and I could never be impossible because I'm me. I'm, I'm here. I'm in this realm. I'm in this world. I'm a very real person. Um, and there was a ton of shame around that. Um, and, and not only physical, you know, um, my character, one of the, my, my biggest um, coping mechanisms is from, from my childhood experience is to be a fighter. I'm not, a, I have a very soft side, I have a very warm side, but maybe if it was like this and maybe if it was, and, you know, right. start playing with the puppet a little bit and I can't be that, I'm me. Um, so there was a lot of shame. There was also a lot of self-inflicted shame that he had in it. And then like the, the emotional weight of all that shame between us and bring a baby into the picture. And this poor child, the energy that she, um, that she nursed with and from and around, it, it was... Right. I wonder if it's worth going into some of the details here um, for others because that what you're referring to about that, that shame that a woman will often take upon themselves when their husband is the one struggling with this. And oftentimes yeah. the struggle started before they knew each other. Yeah. Um, and the struggle has, you know, there's this uh, video, maybe you've heard me talk about it in the past, but I had seen it in early recovery and I haven't found a way to look it up without bumping into porn mm-hmm. since. So I, um, so I haven't looked for it again, seen it again, but there was a video of a porn star explaining why she left the industry. Yeah, I've heard it. And what she was explaining was that she walked into her, her uh, she walked in on her boyfriend masturbating to porn. Yeah. And it threw her whole idea of what was going on, you know, completely off. Because until then, she was like, okay, I'm more beautiful than other women. And that's why men around the world want to look at me. <laughs> <wanna look at, laughs> right. But here was the one man that she wanted to be with right. and enjoyed being with and yeah. was not doing it for, for work. And he was going to porn to watch other women. And she said, like, obviously there's something else going on here, meaning it's not, it's not strictly about one person mm-hmm. being attracted and another not being attractive. It's more about there's a, a completely different need that's being met through this search and recognizing that she said, I don't want to be a part of it and left the industry. 
I wish more women would, you know, <laughs> take her lead. I remember, I remember hearing that story on one of your podcasts, and that was also a part of, you know, the the glimmers that made their way to me that helped me realize um, this is not this is not just me. Like it, this is not a, my lacking that's causing it. I I also remember um, talking about that time. Um, well, I thought I remembered, and now I'm blinking. Um, oh, I I lacked. What, during that time we were living in Crown Heights, I remember thinking, how did I not see this? How can I trust myself right. um, to be safe in this? How did you this? find out? Um, how did I find out? I, um, I walked in on Avi on a phone, and he's, he was very, very open. He was like... He always was, right? He has that easy openness. The him. shame kept it, you know, it, it came out. At, you know what? As um, the more and more safe he felt, the more and more he sheared. And, and that's the truth with all of us, with our own demons and secrets inside of ourselves. The more love and and um, support and kindness we have inside of ourselves, the more the subconscious is going to allow the darkness out to be, you know, seen. Um, yeah, Avi sheared. There, there were issues with, like, you know, gaslighting when you convince yourself there's nothing to share because that's a part of the addict um, mind at the time. But what I was... A part of really what kept me um, gripped for a long time in that in that period was how my self confidence and my self worth. I have a baby. I have a baby coming. How am I navigating this world? I I'm I thought that I could um, date well enough and get close enough and ask questions while we dated that people thought I was crazy for asking. But come on, like do your due diligence and feel it out and don't read the mask, read the energy. But here, hey, I was duped. Right. So that was. Um, so, you, so you took that. Uh, you took that shame on you as well. Yeah. 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 I was fooled. I'm not okay. And yeah. So for three years you didn't tell um, anyone, and that was while Avi was in recovery. Right, yeah, Avi was going to his twelve step meetings. I was so resentful. <laughs> you're leaving the house. You're getting better. I'm home. I'm sick. I, I, you know, I went from being very supportive and happy he was doing it, but also being so weighed down by. The meaning of all of this and as you saw like when we made that phone call to you we were living in florida his recovery process didn't bring home a lot of light it was almost like um i think a dry drunk the shame was there the right. you know it kept him away from the thing that he judged himself for but it you know the light wasn't being out the darkness wasn't being alchemized yet into substance that we can live off of um I, I did tell one person um, right when I found out, and she fell. Out, she was a therapist. She fell out of my life, and um, and then I don't know what was my my phone call to you was probably um, my way out right. from there. So take us on the the journey from there, and then I want to go back to the child sex abuse. Sure. The Meaning, so after the phone call and after speaking to Avi, so where did what happened? your story um what happened with our story um let me say it differently so some of these ideas that you had where you took responsibility for um not being whatever smart enough or being fooled by the fact that he right that you didn't see this coming number one number two you took responsibility that you weren't enough of whatever it was he was he was looking at so how did that how did that change I'll also, before I answer that, I'll go back to like, how did I not take it personally when he would um, share or when we mm -hmm. in that state? I do, I do have this ability and this gift to maybe it's it, it could be a gift. I don't know if it's always a gift to be able to close down what's going on in my I think it's the freeze response, um, like fight, flight, freeze. Like I can put away and compartmentalize my own emotions um, and be there for someone in pain. And I think that um, while Avi was shearing and falling apart and terrified to admit the thing that he's struggling with um, and me being able to hold him and tell him, like, we can do this. It's okay. I got you. You're, there's, there's healing for everything. Um, I didn't believe that until plant medicine, but my energy said, um, I got you. And I think that women have a lot of power. Um, way more and when they step out of that shame and that self-imposed um, all of those you know limitations to be able to do that it really helped us 
Yeah, a thought that I've had is wasn't a thought, but I'll share it as a thought. Is that um, so? Women have the capacity to see, right? It's like one of the things. <coughs> so seeing is believing, right? So a woman can see something and then believe it to be true, right? They can see the the new home that the family will one day have and then believe it and live from that space even when it's not hasn't quite materialized. So the same is true with seeing another human being. So when, you know, I know I, on my worst days when it was, there was a tremendous amount of shame inside and not only shame, demoralization, hopelessness, yeah. it just didn't feel like there was any way out. You know, it almost feels like, wow, all of my life led up to this moment. Like, <laughs> that's it. So it can feel tremendously hopeless. And when there's someone and for whatever reason a woman can provide this, I think there's multiple reasons why, but one is that capacity to see and then when they see it, they believe it, and they come back to the man and say, like, this isn't who you are. I see you in a different light. <coughs> I, and the man can start believing that about himself. Yeah, I was talking to an energy healer from Spot that has been a part of my journey, one of, one of many healers. Um, it was like this month, and she told me, um, Leah, you've got to dance yourself out of this, a, a particular a challenge or um, program. <coughs> that I'm working on deconstructing that, you know, has a grip on me. And she said, you know, when they said that in the merit of the women, the, we left Egypt in the merit of the righteous mm -hmm. women, and it talks about their song and dance and tambourine and lift up your voice. She was guiding me to celebrate as though it already happened, like manifest and bring your entire body and all of your energy and take it in with thanks to God, gratitude, um, triumphant, you know, right. a praise to God for his goodness and his kindness um, in, 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 in anticipation. And it's kind of like the seeing and believing, like see it, like manifest it, envision it, and bring it back to your challenge. That, that's been true for a lot of the ways I've walked my way out of challenges with my children um, and, and this, this topic too. Yeah, it definitely helps for a man to have that, and especially a woman, a woman who's not like their mother because – Women can give off two different kind of energies for a man. One is the mother, which is always like, I accept you no matter what. Right. So coming from a mother, it's not quite the same, but coming more from a, like a, a romantic relationship, meaning you know, a woman who sees herself as an equal to the man, not unconditional love. But no, I see, I see you as an equal, and I see that potential for you, not because I'll accept whatever you throw at me, but because I see you as someone who can be completely different than you are today. Like that, that can change a man big time. Yeah. Important energy for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for it. What? Thank God for it. You know, when a woman finds that energy within herself, she's activating her power and her feminine, the feminine gifts that this world needs. And she, you know, it's, it's, it's within her um, tools. So the man needs it. The woman needs it. It's, yeah, we were going to jump to, um, to um, child abuse or plant medicine, which one? Because I was going to say something about plant medicine now. Yeah, go into plant medicines, but before you do, I just wanted to say that the way this conversation came about was because my wife was in a circle with you led by her sister, sister. right, Natanya Light, who leads these little circles and ceremonies, sometimes more than little, sometimes there's a lot of people in it. I was going to say, they're not little yeah. in number, they're very powerful. Right. Yeah. I've heard very beautiful things about it. I sat in some, which were more family related but most of them that she do are that she that she hosts and leads are women only she lives in california but she does some in florida so she did one on Sukkot. right that I went to. you were and my wife was in there as well yeah and the next morning she said to me you gotta interview leah roboshkin mm -hmm. so i sent you a message thank you yeah. thanks um you know in that um in that Sukkot um cacao ceremony that natanya led um I took the cacao and it's a heart opener mm -hmm. and the medicine hit my heart and I was face to face with my inner child who I last saw in that in the same um, way in an ayahuasca ceremony and it's like oh here here we are like we're face to face and um she wasn't so glad to see me it was it was there was pain there was um and we went on this, you know, I had my journey, I had my conversation, my apologizing, my all, all the tools that I need, pull on it, bring it there, be with her, be with myself and my wounds. Um, 
And after in the integration process, whoever wanted to um, was invited to share. So part of my story and my being abused as a three-year-old girl um, came out. And I guess the safety of that, um, the feminine energy and all the women holding each other was so magical that it prompted me to share the bits and pieces in flow, whatever came. Um, and the next morning... And that was the first time in a group setting that you spoke about it? Yeah, yeah. It, it came out on medicine, you know, the, the right. screams, the rage, the, there's, a, uh, there's a many um, sisters, sacred sisters that um, have heard me and been with me. And, but this was cacao. It, you know, it's gentle. It's not, um, it, it's not doing it's not the work. It's not psychoactive, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, Avi woke me up the next morning after that ceremony, and I, I usually wake up a little angry almost every morning. Like, there's not this, thank you, I'm alive. Even though since plant medicine, I have many more days like that, and there's much less, why am I in this world energy? Um, but he woke me up, and I even noticed, like, I, I jumped up with joy. Like, there was, I, I kind of sensed that, um, even though I was very sleep deprived, I got home late until I went to bed, until I fell asleep, my soul was charged. I was nourished not from sleep, but from the other energies that this world offers. And it was in cheering and in finding my voice and my freedom of this story gripping me um, that did that to me. But the next day, um, my jaw locked. I couldn't, something happened in my mouth, in my jaw. I couldn't open it. I couldn't get food in past for a week. Huh. And it was like high program that says silence, keep okay. this a secret. Like, I see you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to heal you. But it, it's it's real. The shearing and the shame and the protect my jaw literally locked in protection of me staying silent. Um, yeah. Yeah. The um, Brene Brown has this term. I don't know if you come across it called vulnerability hangover. Right. I mean, she doesn't talk about lockjaw associated with it, but the <laughs> the idea, the concept of it'll often come after this tremendous elation. Yeah. when we share something and like, wow, I, I can't imagine that I did that. I thought for years I held that inside and felt like if I let that out that I would disintegrate. And here I didn't. And especially if you do it in a safe space, you end up getting a lot of acceptance, a lot of support. And then the next day the thoughts kick in and say, but they definitely thought that. I know they said this, but they definitely <laughs> thought that I'm this. Or why did I share that much? I can't believe I, I said in front of so many people, why did I do it in this way? Yeah, I've had that many times. It's a very good sign that We've pushed past. Uh, you did something big. Yeah, it's the equivalent of um, being sore after a workout. It's hard to get sore yeah. if you're regularly regularly working out, yeah. but if you hit a muscle in a completely different way, then right, it will respond with soreness. And also, like, there's so much opportunity in that vulnerability hangover for practicing self compassion, self kindness. Take yourself on a date. Be with yourself through this. Like, you know, our children are going to have to go through really, really hard things, but they don't have to do it alone, and neither do we. We don't have to leave all of those emotions unattended inside of ourselves after that, you know, that sore workout. We get to, for me, it's like get to practice what I preach. Here I am um, developing this this kindness, compassion, support, write myself a letter. To, you know, Right, do, doing it for yourself. Exactly. Bring it home, Bring yeah. which is... I, I think where all the magic happens from from you and you become that embodied person with all of that wisdom and all of that Brene Brown stuff, but you you um, implement it for yourself. It becomes your own muscle. It comes from you. Hundred percent. Yeah, those are the changes. The changes. The the work is inside out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we do the work on ourselves, and then we have the opportunity to to share it with someone else. If the work isn't set in, then the impact likely won't. Uh, yeah. I'll be sitting with someone else. So um, what are some aspects of what you shared there that you're still comfortable sharing? Meaning in terms of the, the story you mentioned it happened at three years old. Are you comfortable um, sharing details? I won't, I won't work with what I shared there because then I'll be in my head. Um, I'll work from my heart. Um, and um, there are, you know, people talk about repressed memories. So... Mm -hmm. That very much came up in my healing journey. Um, I always knew who I was afraid of. My whole family knew who I was afraid of. Um, they just didn't know why. They 
experienced him scaring me publicly, and they assumed that I was a sensitive child, I was three, and that him, you know, um, screaming at me publicly was the reason that I was terrified of him. Um, there was so much more beneath the surface, right under everyone's nose. Um, this was a very, very close family friend who had access because he, no matter where I was, he was always a block away, whether it was in a summer home, whether it was in my childhood um, home. Um, and, you know, there are parts that were repressed and then the body, you know, the body I knew, the soul, mm -hmm. you know, what was going on. And um, it's interesting that even before plant medicine, like when I went to see healers about um, Avi's addiction, the first thing that would come out of my mouth when they said, like, where do you want to start, was this story. And I didn't have... Um, what was the story then at that time when the memories were still somewhat repressed? I would just tell them that there's this guy in my, in my childhood that was terrifying and that I would, you know, check my porch to see if he was on his porch. And if he wasn't, then I would make a dash from my porch to the car, his car, and like peek through the window to see if his eyes would befall me. And if not, then make the next dash over. Um, the first woman that I told, she asked me, she's like, I want you to look down at your neck now. You're, you're blotched and red and you're, you didn't stop turning your rings. Like, just pay attention to the body keeps the score, right? right? And like, I guess she, she was sensing that this would be a journey that I would go on, um, but pay attention to your body because it has cues for you. Um, so I guess in each um, plant medicine ceremony that I did, starting with psilocybin, it came out very clearly. Um, the repressed physical, um, I had to go through a little bit of the my my um younger um my younger version story um and the awareness um and each journey showed me something else brought out more um what's interesting though is that when i do um my weekly appointment with my somatic inner child therapist that's actually where um the memories come out the strongest now since mm -hmm. the medicine um, when I'm in a sober state, and it's just coming out of my body. Um, and that's been very validating for me because there's one program that doesn't believe. Like, no one's going to believe you. That's what kept me quiet, right? Like, which three-year-old doesn't go tell their parents that the father's best friend and the mother's, like, is molesting or raping a little girl? Right. Um, the, the, the boogeyman that's keeping you quiet, that's saying no one's going to believe you. And right. so the answer is most, by the way, that most people wouldn't. Most people don't talk. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the other, like I said, with sex, with like sex addiction, there's the shame that keeps it in. So with sex abuse, it's the silence that. Yeah. That keeps it going. And it's the silence is that infects everyone. Somehow we all want to be silent around this. Yeah. The subject. It seems to be like the. The energy comes in with its protector, you know, it's okay, there's going to be sex abuse, and with it, it's going to inject everyone around the situation yeah. with a desire to just to be silent about the whole thing. It's the individual's response, it's the communal response. I don't know what it is with women because I didn't research it, but I know with men, the average age that a man who talks about his sexual abuse eventually does is in his 40s. Oh, wow, that's, yeah. har that's heartbreaking. Yeah, and we're talking about child sex abuse. That's heartbreaking. Right, so yeah, we're you know yeah. you um in your TED talk um you said that when you speak publicly about porn you're kind of committing that by the time your son is a certain age the world will look a little bit different in you know in terms of the landscape of right I guess in me doing this podcast my hope is that by the time my daughters are older the world will look different around sex abuse um the, the, it you know it makes me. Um, think when you say like you know this energy comes in and it silences everyone that it touches um, I'm seeing that a lot of the the programs that I have to dismantle are not mine a lot of the energies are not mine they're the man that abused me and um, in his abuse there was this transmission or these downloads of his energy into me through the most sacred um, pathways um, and it's, yeah, I think that um, 
this be quiet is also one of the downloads like him being quiet because maybe he was perpetrated and because of what he's you know the act um it's this this is yeah it, it all comes down to the person and yeah okay so you were saying that um you there was this voice inside you doubting whether whether it happened and that was something that you had to overcome yeah through this process and you were continuing i segued so i want to bring it back to where you were and um, where it's going to go to yeah it, it, that that voice inside was very hard to heal with um you have all the about all the testimony the witnesses the experiences my body you know screaming believe me believe me um, and then this brain program saying, um, but maybe it didn't happen, but maybe it didn't happen. Right. Um, and I look at that part as like a, a protector part that, that um, you know, in its wonder of whether or not a person can heal from something so devastating um, and where will the solutions come from and where will the healing come from? And so if it didn't happen, maybe you can move forward. And it, it's not a bad part. It's a protector that's trying to keep me safe um from from owning my story um but a, a few might it also be a protector um you know in response of what you think you may get if you share it with someone else definitely definitely you know not being believed um that was something that i had to journey with sober on medicine in, in all in all realms not being believed by my parents not being believed by my siblings who you know grew up in this other home like it was a second right. pa family home? Um, I've spoken to my siblings and we've navigated their reactions. Um, I've spoken to my parents, um, and what that taught me um, was taught me a lot of things. You know, bringing my parents into the story um, and shattering their worldview. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trusting of another family, of another person. You were um, believed when you brought up with your... I was believed by my mother, and I didn't directly tell my father. My father, um, my mother spoke to my father first. I wasn't ready to share that truth with him. This was, I don't know how anyone can consider this person a best friend, but <laughs> he was in some ways, you know. Um, my mother spoke to my father about it, and I think my father lived with a similar, like, dance that I lived with. Eventually, um, my father and I met at this person's grave this past summer, and I stood there for a few minutes while my father stood there, and then eventually my, I just screamed. Everything came out, all the things that he did to me, all the positions, ways, programs. The words or the feelings? Everything. It was, it was loud. I was screaming. And I was it was just a scream. It wasn't words. No, there were words. Other words. I was screaming at him. My voice was loud. Um, you did this and this and this. And, wow. I, and um, my father was out of the corner of my eye, I guess, like shocked into like this. Um, and then eventually, like two, three minutes in, he grabbed my body. He held me. He held me really, really tight um, and just stood there and you know, it, he, um, I guess it was the hug that I waited for right. for every single time I was abused. When will my parents know? When will they come and save me? When will they come hug me? And he held my hand, walked me to the aisle, to the Rebbe, and we both stood in front of the Rebbe. He went through his process, which I can't imagine what it's like, like, you know, as a father to hear your little daughter tell you that um, and you stand before the Rebbe with that knowledge and what is this world what is going on how does God's world work um, we we drove home together and we listened to Rabbi YY um, we spoke a lot me giving him hope <laughs> you spoke a lot to your my dad my father and I we had a three-hour drive back upstate oh, and um, he asked questions about God and abuse and Hasidus and my story. Um, and in our conversations, I played to him um, some of Rabbi YY um, taught a mimer from the Tzemach Tzedek called Kohen Balmum. And um, it addresses sex abuse. And um, one of the healers that I 
worked with, this woman from Tzfa, one day she sends me, like, you have to listen to this, this um, discourse, this Hasidic discourse. And I did. And it, it was one of the most um, powerful healing tools that, that have um, met me so far in my journey. Um, I, I sobbed as I listened to the Tzemach Tzedek describe a soul's journey into darkness, into the souls that choose the mission of sex abuse. Oh, wow. They're the, yeah, the, the Tzemach Tzedek describes, um, he quotes a Zohar, and when the moon and God are arguing about who's going to be bigger, the sun or the moon, um, in middle of this conversation where the moon is negotiating its powers and um, the souls that are traveling through this river out of um, Gan Eden, um, those are the souls that have chosen, for the, chosen upon themselves and accepted the burdens of going into um, the missions of sex addiction, sex abuse. I think addiction, I more understood it as abuse, but like to go into the trenches of this, of this exile and go on a journey there, all leading up to it's finding its power and, you know, attacking back. By the way, um, just to, I'm not sure there's a meaningful difference between the two. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. And there are ways in which it is, but I'll tell you why there's ways which there is, it may not be meaningful for the point you're making. So one of the ways, you know, I wrestled with a long time was I sexually abused because I was sexually abused by a teenager. So maybe... How could he be guilty? Eventually, I came to terms which, with the fact that it, it doesn't really matter if a teenager fired a rocket or if an adult fired a rocket. If it hits you, it's going to hurt yeah. right, or kill you. So, um, but those, those thoughts were there. And eventually, one way I said, I said, maybe instead of saying, was I sexually abused or not, maybe I'll just flip the words and say, was my sexuality abused? And if you look at it from that way, then... It doesn't really make a difference how it got there, but if someone's relationship with sexuality is divorced from intimacy, whether it was introduced to them, for example, through your experience as um, a child where you were introduced to sexuality without the, um, the intimacy, the trust, the safety of a relationship, forget a, a child can't be, right? It's the only way, but you're introduced to sexuality, divorced from intimacy, or whether your rela someone's relationship over time develops where they're using sexuality primary as a pleasure-seeking tool divorced from the intimacy that um, it's meant to have, then, yeah, our sexuality is abused, and that's the, that's the work you're saying. I want to bring it back to, yeah. um, to what he was saying, and perhaps, I mean, definitely I'd like for you to share it with me, the uh, sure. why sure. do I talk, but hopefully we'll remember yeah. to put it in the notes for, as well. For sure, Rabbi Waiwai um, talks about how so many people give him so much flack for why do you talk about these topics? Why do you? And the emails and the private responses because these topics are not yet public. Mm -hmm. um, one day, God willing, they will be. You know, people not hiding their stories. Um, but that, that mimer was a, a total um, flip for me because it told me, no, you're not the scum of the earth. You're not this worthless, ugly little girl that no one looked at and saw. And so this man came. Actually, you were a very bright light. And he is a smart form of klipa or a, a smart form of trauma. And he, 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 he drank from your light. Like that's, this mimer talks about how any light that you bring in this world, the way, God, the way it works is that the darkness will come and um, engulf it. Um, and I was able to, I guess when I heard those truths from a, a source that I trust, from a source that um, has stood by me in ayahuasca ceremonies, in, in the brinks of challenges in, in every way of my life, the way um, certain Rabbeim and Hasidus and David HaMelech, like, those were like, those were pillars that kept me strong during very hard times. So hearing from the Tzemach Tzedek's words of, you are not forsaken, you are not forgotten, this is a hard journey and the validation of like which souls are chosen for this the ones that were next to the moon and the moon speaking her truth right god says she says to god like am i gonna have to diminish myself because i speak truth very often in this world i feel like the truth seekers are the ones that get not punished but like get hit um it's 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 a beautiful healing um powerful uh mimer that that really really helped me beautiful yeah. Look, I'll try to remember to uh, 
to share it here. So you listen to that on the drive back with your with my dad, your dad. yeah, to help him, um, to help him, um, maybe give him some of the the medicine that we swear is in Torah. All the healing can be found mm -hmm. in Torah. Um, I'll also just share on that experience of my father um, driving with me and holding me the way that he held me. A few a few weeks later was Rosh Hashanah, and I was nervous because I'm going into this year and am I crowning God my king again? Am I choosing this this feminine and this masculine God that I know and saw and feel? And um, I'm going into this relationship again anew. Um, and a very emotional getting ready for the for the holiday. And I think on the night of the Yom Tif, the holiday, I was putting my daughter to sleep. And was the question of am I choosing my God anew this year? Was it specifically relevant to what was going to to what had happened with your dad? Was that part of it, or just it, it, it's it's um that comes up every year. It's, it probably does come up every year, but now that I have so much of my subconscious um, history and programming and wounds so fresh, it's, uh, it's a total new experience. Um, and then the specific part of my father was that, um, you know, I think Rabbi Shays Tabs talks about how the, your, your first gods are your mother and your father. Mm -hmm. The relationship that you and them, they create with you, you then project onto God. And it, this, there's this loop, this feeding, this cycle, um, until we're told to shatter the God of our father and leave your father's home and go find your own truth, your own God, lach lacha, leave your father's home. That's what Avram is told. Right. Um, but what, what I was seeing here was when on that, that eve of Rosh Hashanah, the feeling in my body of my father holding me like came through me to this feeling of like, God, you're holding me. This projection that I, my human father holding me allowed for my godly father to hold me in this beautiful, um, new divine way. Beautiful. Um, yeah, there's there's a link, there's a loop there. What we experience here, all these relationships that we have, the richer they are, the more meaningful they are. They're all tools for our our bond with Hashem. The the, the more we lean into them, the more the more rich they are, the more rich that relationship can be. Yeah, there was a uh, a workbook that I did early recovery it was by Patrick Carnes mm -hmm. called uh, the Gentle Path. Mm -hmm. He calls it the Gentle Path through the Twelve Steps, and uh, you know, a healing workbook for sex addiction. And during it. It's a, you know, it's a workbook, so you're filling out different things, blanks or circling stuff. And at some point, he asks for, he gives you a, a list of, I think it was 24 adjectives, and circle six of them um, that best represent your relationship with your dad. Mm. And, you know, go ahead and do that. And then the workbook continues, and you're filling out a bunch of other things. So maybe a number of pages later, he asks a similar question. Same adjectives, but it's it's um, it's moved around, so you don't realize it's the right. it's exactly the same question. And also, there's been enough work in between that most people probably don't catch it. I didn't catch it, but this time he's asking: circle the six adjectives that best describe your relationship with with God. And then when you flip the page, he says, "Okay, now go back and compare." And he puts them, I think, into four different categories. One is, um, you know, loving and caring. Another one is, um judgmental, conditional, punitive, uh, non-existent, you know, um, or non, uh, or like, I, I think like not, like not like non-existent, but your Actually. issues aren't big enough mm. for him. Like, you know, yeah, like there, but irrelevant. Kind of right. thing. Like I've, there may have been, the categories may be slightly different, but you, it was virtually identical, the two. And that was a point he makes there as well, is that, our relationship with our parents. He was connecting it to father, as I remember, for maybe, maybe for most people going through that workbook. But regardless, that that relationship is really what someone believes about God. People can you can learn all the my mom said this you want, but it's going to first start with the relationship with Papa. Your human mama. God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your um, yeah. At one point in um, one of my uh, post journeys in between, um, I've had this like sensation of like. 
I feel bad for my parents because no matter how much they gave me, it never would have been enough. There's this infection rotting inside of me. There's this leak of this abuse that I had inside. And all the love, all the fun, all the joy, there was an unaddressed infection. Um, and, and, you know, we all have our relationships with our parents and they're, they're, they're complex as they're supposed to be, right? David HaMelech says, um, like my parents abandoned me and God took me in, God mm. saved me. I, I think it's our human um, rite of passage, like in this world, this process is supposed to be. Um, but um, where I would, you know, what I did come back to my parents with is the way we treat children. Um, most of us don't want to hear a child crying. It triggers a lot in us, um, seeing someone in pain, seeing someone needy, our own um, uh, unanswered cries as a child. I mean, the list is endless. But where I, where, um, where I felt things could have um, helped me, you know, if I can go back, um, I wasn't really allowed to cry openly. If something was distressing, like, we survived the Holocaust, we survived communism, like, here's a lolly, we're gonna go, at, like, distract was a very, very um, utilized tool in the way I was raised. And it, you know, it, it came, it could have come from a compassionate place, you don't wanna see your child in distress, but after I had my daughter, and I was looking at the way I was, you know, the parenting advice that's available, the way other people raise their children and what's coming out of me, and they were all in conflict my natural reaction or response, I wasn't seeing mere, like um, embodied or emulated around me. And um, I ended up finding this um, woman who, who, she goes by Respectful Mom on Instagram, and I bought her course. Uh, it's called Welcoming the Waves of Emotion. And it's, it taught me that honor my child's pain, be a witness to it in a validating but not overburdening way. Respect your child, respect them. Um, it's this dynamic that when you turn a certain age, I'm not sure what that age is, you, you earn the right to be respected and heard and have a place. My, my daughter was at the table, I think she was 18 months old, and my mom was interacting with her, and um, maybe someone said, maybe my daughter should move to another cheer. I don't know what it was, but my daughter looked at my mom and said, I'm a pussin. I'm... <laughs> and my mother was so shaken. Like years later, she says, my 18-month-old granddaughter had to teach me in my 60s that that she's a person and I get to be a person like um yeah so I think um in uh, my child uh, experience of being abused it would have been really nice to have been able to cry about it um to have, you know not to keep it all locked up and right. hidden what's your feeling now on it do you feel like it could be healed my story sexual abuse in general yes I do, I do. Um, after my first mushroom trip, I walked away saying, now I'm safe in this world. There's nothing that can't be cured. That was, I, I walked away with a lot of gifts, but that was like the, I guess the intellectual thought that was going through me. My body was in heaven. I didn't know I could be this happy or relaxed in this world in my life. But, um, Yes, there's, there's real, real, real healing. Um, I think if you don't think that there could be real healing, you don't believe in personal redemption. All, all the Hasidists were taught, all this personal and collective geula that we're fighting for, it's, it's all right in front of us. We're, it's all clues, it's codes, but with a lot of faith, like deeply harnessed faith um, in who came before us and in developing a god that believes and wants your healing for you and calling on him through everything there's there's a real beautiful way out yeah that amen let's talk a little bit about um plant medicine you've referenced it a few times but sure. uh, was that something that was um a quick and easy decision for you to you heard about it you said okay i'll try it or were there um, a lot of mental hurdles you had to overcome I don't think there were a lot of mental hurdles. Uh, I, th I think I heard you he talk about it on your podcast. I heard it around me. Um, I think me and Avi spoke about it, were curious about it, wanted more from life, from healing. And we contacted 
Some, it, yeah, don't refer and to we, specific we people. We got um, a contact, set up appointments for ourselves, and um, in between booking the appointment and and the date set, I got um, COVID again. And with that came um, long haulers. I don't know, they're one of the ways they were referring to symptoms. Right. That, you know, the physical symptoms stopped. Long COVID. Yeah. And they were neurological. They were very dark thoughts. They were a lot of deep anguish and emotion. Um, and I went into that journey, my first journey, I think passively suicidal. Like, just take me. I can't do this. If a bus came and there, there was no like hard event that happened in the, my marriage or it, it was seemed very connected that the COVID just brought up repressed, um, repressed energies inside of yeah. me. Uh, I, I walked out of that journey um, without any of that in a, in a beautiful, beautiful And it hasn't place. come back. No, thank God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you speak to a lot of people about plant medicine, my understanding. I, I accept the phone calls that come my way <laughs> this year. Um, what are some of the most common um, let's call it questions or challenges that people have to it, and how do you address them? Um, questions and challenges. Um, I mean, I'm referring not to people who've already done it and want your assistance with integration, but people. Barriers who, to entry. Barriers to entry, yeah. I definitely sense um, whether people are saying it straight out or not. Um, we're in Torah and religion. Do you get give yourself permission? I, I get that a lot. Will the Rabbanim, what do the Rabbanim have to say on this? That's something. I have my own answer. Everyone, I'm sure. Um, um, there's there's so much fear. Fear attached to people's identity. I, I see that... Um, People are holding on to their religious identity so, so power, like with like gripped. And me and my husband, when we talk to them, whatever, whoever it is, it's like if you really believe in what you claim, that God is so good, that Torah is so good, <laughs> let go of it for five hours and see if it's as powerful as you're swearing it is. What makes you think you're going to walk away from this? Like you're going to leave this realm and you're going to. Right. There, there's um, there's a lot of. Fear, and I understand why. Like your identity, you, what you're, you know, something that I came to. But you're not saying that um, going into a psychedelic journey is the same as leaving this realm. You're just saying if that's your worst fear, that this is not a religious thing to do. Right. Then go ahead and do it, and if you don't come back, how strong was it anyway? Is that what you're saying? That's kind of my, my point, but also my experience has shown me um, that the things that are true, they don't go away. You get to choose them again. Or this is, it's, this is um, the things that they're afraid of are, are uh, I'm having my own experience with it that, that um, I, I, I also, you know, on the topic of like ego, I think what, where it's coming from for them is this like um, this identity that they have that, you know, makes them feel safe in this world, gives them a purpose. It's connected to their job. It's connected to their shluchas. It's connected to how they know themselves to be in every one of their relationships. Um, I came to understand that like my I could compare my ego to like a sec security surveillance program where um you can have a home that has 45 cameras covering every one of the square inches of it. That security surveillance system or ego is developed with when there's a lot going on. There's a lot of um, chaos in a child's life and there's no parent or adult there to guide. Do we need, should we dispatch and set up a camera there? Is that worthy of paying attention to or is this something that's going to pass? When a child is left to navigate their internal landscape on their own, when there's no witness or um, someone willing to come into that space with them to talk to them about their fears, their experiences in school, whatever it is, they have to become hypervigilant and set up as many cameras as they see fit. Eventually, there's nowhere to walk. You, you become an adult, and every square inch is setting off an alarm. Okay. Um, and when, when I go into like Pesach and everyone talks about ego, like matzah, flatten your, um, <laughs> like it really, um, there's a reason the surveillance cameras went up. And if you lovingly 
look at them and take down one at a time with gratitude and appreciation and thanks and awareness of why they went up with a lot of compassion and and um and like almost an apology like you were you were left without life inside of here there's nowhere to live here this place is crowded with technology and security systems um then the ego doesn't have to be so big and so powerful and so on guard all the time it, it can just be a healthy attuned someone does something i feel angry i understand someone violated me i choose what you know my method for handling that my emotions are my surveillance cameras i'm aware of the input and the output um so you know i i see very much like going into plant medicine am i willing to look at this whole ego surveillance system um that are in, that's in place for us so most of the the ways you're seeing that ego show itself with people talking to you is through re religiosity judaism and there you know there's the there, jewish identity mostly that and then there's also um I've heard a lot, um, if I got this far with strictness and discipline and more of like a gvura approach. A what approach? Gvura. Right. Like, you know, um, strength and discipline. Um, or, or you can really supplement that with anything. If I got this far with my pseudo self, my, my, my false identity, why should I go find my true identity? Like, is the risk, is the risk worth the reward? So you, so you feel like there's an understanding at that point that there's resistance to it, but there's an understanding that they may find their true self. In this, is, um, in, this is not a first off right. conversation. This is um, conversations with you know, people that are um, in deep relationships with, and so you can hear that. Um, or, or my husband had this with a few people. It's, and what comes out is, like, do you really believe that you have a piece of God inside of you? Do you really believe you all this knowledge, all this? Go, go. Like what? I, I think people um, are terrified of their darkness and their shame, and their they think that's them. They sense it's there, and um, rightfully so. Like, will oh, it's scary, yeah. will that piece of God be stronger than years of exile that that every nation, especially the Jewish nation, has beard? Like, it's a scary um, uh, thought. I guess. Has plant medicines brought you closer to Judaism? Or further away in some ways? Or? I, I would like to think, um, in my experiences, um, very much. It made Judaism real to me. I, more real. It was always real. It was always uh, my choice of, of being in this world. But the Torah is real. The challenge is, there, it's not a history book. It's, your own, it's my own life. It's the, the steps and the challenges that I'm going to take and the portals that the greats have walked through and left wisdom and guidance for me if I want to tap in, if I want to call on, if I want to learn from. Um, it, it's literally like living with 3D instead of like a flat Judaism. Right. Yeah, it definitely brings it to... Um, that's That's been the case with me. You know, a lot of people um, when I talk to will mention things like Avedah Zara or that's more common with me because to say Rabbanim, I not necessarily every aspect of my life can I point to a rabbi that says it's okay. But Avedah Zara is like a big, you know, <laughs> I was like, do you really want to? But, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding, right? Is that the, and it's not only the case with me, it's the case with many people who I speak to that their um, Judaism has become enriched and enlivened and used the word 3D as a result of um, journey with plant medicine. Yeah, it, it really gives you access to, like I did yoga this week. It was a spiritual experience. I was crying. I was moving energy. Uh, I heard your um, conversation with Rabbi Dover Pinson. Mm -hmm. um, I love his content. He, you know, there were a few people that I was able to learn from, um, you know, during a phase when the schooling that I had and my experiences kept a lot out, except for like my own personal ruminations. And then there were a few clean sources that went in without all, you know, everything attacking it. Um, and I liked his content a lot. But you, you had this dialogue with him around, if I understood it, was what could people reach these depths that we're talking about with plant medicine or with Kabbalah or other, you know, other forms of 
I don't know what the answer is for, for everyone, but definitely nothing is the same with plant medicine. Every, every, there's, there's, I've access to the soul, the energy, the bot, like, and... Um, yeah, it's a very theoretical conversation, and it would be appropriate um, maybe if people were in suffering. Yeah, I, I, um, that's, <laughs> I was working with a homeopath for my daughter, and he's, he's very secular Israeli, and I told him, my daughter's really not doing well. Um, I did ayahuasca recently. There's so much emotion. There's so much energy in our home right now, and she's very, um, you know, almost too attuned to me, and it's feeding into her energy body, um, and it's, it's causing her a lot of distress. So he, he smiled. We finished the interview for my daughter. He prescribed what he needed to. Um, and then he like circled back and he's like, tell me, Leah, like who gave you um, the rabbis? They let you, um, they let you do ayahuasca like in, in the Chabad. And I, I looked at him, I said, um, I didn't ask anyone because when I was having suicidal thoughts, when I was left alone to deal with child sexual abuse and sexual addiction, we are those voices to help me and hold me from that rabbinic sphere. Like I, I hold, I hold it very close, and there's so much reverence and respect. And if you're gonna comment on something that's um, dominant in my life, please comment on the things that steal my soul, because I was abused and my soul was taken. So show me how to find it. Right. Yeah, I um, I agree. I think it's um. You know, for the most part, I think that um, they're not real questions. They're not actually real questions. Like, if we really want to talk about Abay Dazara, then we're better off talking about people's relationship with money or fear mm. yeah. or anger yeah. than we are um, talking about, like, plants, yeah. you know. And, you know, I've had a conversation a lot with someone close to me who has a lot to say about ayahuasca and the shaman and the, the ritual and everything else around that. And I said, I understand. As soon as you take some mushrooms, go into a room by yourself. All right, then I'll know that this thought isn't coming from you trying to protect yourself from it because that has none of that, right? It's right. just, yeah, and yeah. If you want to make a bracha, it's a haka, by the way. And <laughs> I, so the I, I had a similar experience. I said, whoever really cares about the Jewish people and they're in that, they sit on those seats. Um, they should find a support circle and let us know if we're really doing something that's beyond safe, you know, in Torah's eyes. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very thankful to Hashem. A lot, a lot makes sense now that my eyes are more open, now that, um, yeah, that there's a path. And, and it's, it's brutal. It's, I, I know the, the glories are very well known of this healing, and it's, it, it, my experience is, you know, take into account what's going on in your personal family, a baby on the way, or this or that. These have to be weighed, these decisions, because wounds come up, programs get played with, um, and um, there's a right time, and, and it's miraculous, the, the, you know, the, what unfolds. But it's yeah, we're talking about the, the positives, but certainly, and I've done many podcasts on it, but possibly this is the only conversation that someone may watch of me talking about it, so I'll go into it a little bit, is that there are... Um, these are strong tools, powerful tools, and should be considered carefully. And they're also complementary tools, meaning they're not something that's going to have a, a very strong impact on someone if there's nothing else that they're doing right. to benefit themselves in the life. If there's no therapy, if there's no meditation, if there's no mindfulness, if there's yeah. nothing else, um, no other coaches, integration, preparation, you know. And then, of course, yeah, all of those things, this complements it and supports it and adds you know, f fuel to someone's healing journey. But, you know, I've said that, you know, so something a lot of people say is, this is like a thousand hours of therapy. And I say, I disagree. Because I did a thousand hours of therapy and you I never would have touched this. Exactly. Not 10,000, not 100,000. No. There's no. just, you're accessing a different realm that therapy um, doesn't. And all the respect to people who are able to access those states without it. I do meet people like that. I do. I meet people who I have conversations with and they seem to be um, opened to these states mm -hmm. and you can swear they've Dreamed. journeyed with medicines and they'll tell you they didn't. And I'm impressed.
how impressed I got there. I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think I could have. I don't think I could have. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I would uh, second that. I don't think I would have. Um, I'll, I'll also see though in my, my, um, my plant medicine experience, you know, going from the first psilocybin to, you know, um, being invited and seeing the hand of God, you know, leading my journeys, every one of them, when they came up, the conversations that I said prior to the invitation coming my way, the therapy um, session before that I decided that I'm no longer, I'm accepting, but I'm not accepting anymore. Um, and I want healing for certain challenges, health challenges with my children or mm -hmm when I no longer was willing to tolerate certain low standards, you know, on, on that, like having high standards um, for my relationship with myself, with my relationship as a mother, like my motherhood, with my husband, what I knew going into the marriage that I, that I wanted. I wanted a certain, um, I had an idea, you know, and those high standards propelled me when I'm like, no, something's missing the mark here start like ask questions and look around you for talk to God about it because something doesn't feel you know um but I I was talking about the way the invitations or me um pursuing the medicine happened um the the I'm, I'm fairly new into this world a few years in um so I'm sure it's going to change but for now um I did a lot of independent medicine and I, I even like would think ayahuasca is independent it's not a group you're you're in a group but it's a personal it's very non-interactive yeah. zone um and eventually i was talking to um divi bogart who you actually introduced yeah. me to and has been a shining light um awesome. on my path shout out um, to divi she was here we got to bring her back <laughs> um i'll let her know um Tyler, make it happen <laughs> reach out to divi <laughs> Yeah, Divi, uh, I'll, I'll say something when I'm done this story. Um, she and I were integrating around my ayahuasca experience, and she mentioned um, an all women setting in Peru, maybe? All women's. Setting for yes. healing. And I heard her say that, and something shot out inside of me and said, I need that. And I filed it. Like, maybe I commented on it, and I filed it. And a few months later, um, someone that I introduced plant medicine to told me they're sitting in with an all women's group in Miami and I need that, you know, that, that file came out that, that alert, right. um, and someone canceled and last minute I find myself in this group setting with 17 or 18 other, um, uh, women. And I think it was the timing of my story of how much healing I had done before, you know, that made it like a ripe opportunity to be healing in mm -hmm. a group setting. Um, but that was the, what I took from there is like indescribable. So there's a, there's a richness and an, an importance to healing on your own, but then, you know, the concept of healing in a group, you know, we all know like the group, you, you get hurt from people and you heal with people. Mm -hmm in this um all women and the power of like everyone's energy everyone's heart like the the love from their heart being so tangible because it's energy and you're on medicine that makes you sensitive to energy and the way people showed up for each other and the truths that are i i think that this some some of these women some of us are looking at things that go on in our world that no one's willing to admit is going on very ugly dark horrible realities right. and we're sitting there in the broad daylight with enough love to help people heal and hold them and put it out there and like everyone bonding together wh whoever you know whoever it's relevant to in that journey coming together and emitting the force of their love onto this person that for me many of them were strangers but you know I, I walked away from that first journey um, and the, the morning I woke up I you know, I get up to brush my teeth, I meet my eyes in the mirror, I say, welcome home. Like, it just comes out of me, like, I'm a person. Like, I'm back home, I'm here, I went to the bathroom after not being able to go to the bathroom, in the, like, with const constipation for years. Um, the, the, it's, it's powerful, and um, yeah, thank God for it. Thank you for showing us a path. So, uh, women's only spaces, men's only spaces, you're a... I'm a big proponent. Big proponent. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of magic there. Yeah, Avi came recently to the uh, Adama retreat. Yes, he did. Uh, gave us a nice testimonial. 
Did he? Well, he was on the testimonial video we put out there. I'll give my testimony. Um, I had been traveling when he was away, and I came home worn out, like been on the road for two weeks and with my kids. Um, and I came home in this vulnerable place, and um, my, you know, my uh, usual um, efforts, you know, were dimmed, and. He caught me, like he caught our family, he caught himself, he caught, he held all of us in a way that he's, was <clears throat> a new level to all of us. It was, you know, the masculine energy, um, powerful, proud, strong, leading. Um, you know, that was my initial like, wow, this stuff is awesome. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, I went after him a little bit in the, uh, in the retreat, he went hard, but I... I heard, I heard he appreciated it. Yeah, I picked on him a little bit. My, my, um... One of a family member, um, when we talk about ourselves too much, she doesn't. She thinks this generation is very selfish in, in our, in our. Um, Focus talking. on healing. Yes, yes, right. exactly. Um, and she once mentioned to me, there's a hayom yom that says, cherish criticism, because it will bring you to places that some things that right. some things never will. And I, I answered her. Um, I, I think that's very, very true. But I think the context is also cut your nails in the Chabad um, tradition, before you give criticism, you're told to cut your nails and almost like come into this room, like this state of ap apologeticness, like if that's a word, that you're, you have to be doing this. And it's cushioned with, there's a relationship between me and you and there's love between me and you. And so when my criticism comes from my heart, it's going to come into your heart. There's so much, I think that men's container that's to me is like I don't think there's many out there for our community and for our, you know, the Adama weekend to be. He could take it from you, and it's it it brings him to new heights because there's that safety that you create with all the men and all the facilitators and all the all the people involved. Right, there are um, others doing it. Just to be sure, you got Anochi doing stuff. You got Moshe doing stuff. So I don't I don't know their groups. I know them. They, yeah. Yeah. Here, but there's something original and unique here and i do want to shout out to them because they they have been uh in this space for uh for a number of years you know adam klasner was here from anohi and he said you know i saw you doing the retreat and i hope you don't see this as competition and i told him no we're competing with casinos don't worry <laughs> we're not competing <laughs> there's, with you there's room yeah, there's, for there's room for uh, everyone for a lot of people but no i i appreciate that and um in terms of avi you know i know him for four or five years at this point, and we've spoken a lot, but in that context, I was able to see things that I didn't see previously. So it helped. I, I saw that I was able to bring things out. Mm -hmm. It actually was um, like the greatest sign for me that it was something meaningful, which you don't always know. You know, I've tried certain things that work and other things don't, and the stuff that work continue and the stuff that don't, you know, you don't. And uh, one of the signs that this was was that I knew Avi for a long time, and I saw a level of growth in him over that retreat. So I was like, okay, this is something different that I'm able to be a part of, that all the things I was doing and he's been part of, it did not have, meaning this is additive yes. to what was already um, already in place. So, yeah, and, um, you know, Mayor, <laughs> he was very particular that no women allowed. So my wife was very involved in retreat, for example, related to the food and things like that. But he was like, no, you can't come into the house. Like you can communicate with the cook and stuff like that, but <laughs> no yeah. women allowed in the house. Eventually he allowed someone to come in for cleaning for some hours. But for him, it was very important that it's men, it's men only. There's a, um, an energy that we can bring together that can heal in a certain way. And once women come in, it's completely different. And it's probably the same way the other way. Not that there isn't room for some of those as well. A thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just talking to a friend last night. Um, she organized a medicine group that I joined. And um, the first time I had met her, it was with all women and one male present. And then this last time we journeyed together, it was all women. And there, thank God, there's masculine energy, there's feminine energy. It emits and when you have, um, you know, a, a concentration of one, and then you're able to heal, understand, embody in a way that's different when there's um, a combination, and each are vital and important. And right, right. Um, earlier, you mentioned that 
you know, through your journey of being sexually abused as a child and then being married to someone who struggled with sexual addictions, there's been this awareness that you have some important message or mission around sexuality specifically. So you want to talk about that? Um, it, it's not an easy thing to talk about. It's, you know, it's, uh, there's so much information um, that swims through me. Um, if your jaw clamps up afterwards, it should return to itself after a week. Say that again? I said if your jaw clamps up after talking about it. Oh, it should, it should return to itself after a week, yeah. You know, I, I initially um, came into my story, marriage, um, recovery from addiction, with a lot of um, um, anger at the way the Hasidic community handles um, marriage teachers, the inform- you know, the transmission of knowledge. Heavy Christian influence, by the way. Say, sorry? There's heavy Christian influence in the Jewish view. Of, oh, for sure. And the modern-day Jewish view of sexuality is there's a heavy Christian influence, Definitely. which has a certain shame or... Um, like Christianity, my understanding of Christianity is that it views sexuality as an, a necessity for people who have not ascended to a certain level, like some like this base, you know, desire or need or whatever, you know. And Judaism, from from all the writings around it, certainly right. that doesn't exist. But in our upbringing, that message. Certainly right. seem to filter through. So that's what I meant by heavy Christian influence. It, around yeah, it. yeah. There's there's both sides being played, and it's very confusing to a child taking it in for a teenager taking it in. Um, so there there was a lot of um, you know this feeling of like I I felt very um, abandoned. Like I'm a young girl. I'm I'm good. I'm following the path. My husband's a good guy. Following the path. And how did we end up with this much? Um, of a tangled web and mess around this topic, like. But right, when you say good guy, you meant specifically related to he is a, he's a good guy also, but you meant specifically related to Judaism, meaning he followed the path. Yeah, yeah. God, he followed the I path. I guess so. I, it's this feeling of like. I'm just asking if that's what you meant by good guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, like he's he followed he's the Chabad. he followed yeah. the path. He also has a good heart. Right. Okay. You know, he's not. He has a really good okay, heart. So you meant both. Fine. Yeah, yeah. He he just is pure and kind and and. Right. Um. How did this, and, and there was a lot of like, why don't they do it like this? Why don't they, and I, you know, as I journeyed with it, I, I probably still have a lot of um, feedback that I would direct to mothers because honestly, this, you know, once upon a time, um, mothers were this, you know, passed on the knowledge to their daughter. It used to be that this topic was so clear for what it is. I think that's what the literature says, that a mother wasn't awkward in her communication with her daughter around these topics. Um, whatever the feedback, there's feedback to be given from you know from a wife who um, is healing and walking her way away from sex addiction. Um, but I also have a little bit of I guess humility or um, this this um, understanding that it's complicated, um, that sexuality is <coughs> it's this. Portal. It's this giant, most powerful portal. And when a man and a woman are um, engaged, they are they are the manifestation and the embodiment of Hashem being one. Like Achtas Hashem, the thing that we Hasidis pushes, you know, and encourages us to at- attain and achieve. And the goal of this whole reality is um, that <coughs> God should be one. His name should be one. Einad Malvada. There's nothing but God. And then you have this. What, probably one of the only few acts in this that we can um, engage in where a man and a woman create the image of God in this union. <coughs> and um, You're saying it's God-like in a number of ways. In, 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 yes. For the creation, the unification of the masculine and the feminine. Yes, and the, and also in imagery. It says that God created Adam and Chava, B'tal Malokim, in the f- image of God, and then he separated them. I, the, the, if he created them in the image and they were one, Maybe God looks like a man and a woman, but Selim Elokim. I mean, I'm, I'm no um, scholar, right. but you know, it, it, to me, everything that I weigh, um, this is a very powerful portal and tool. And um, wherever there's power, there's going to be fear and peer, fear of people um, finding their power, f- fear of people using this power and this this magic in a holy way, in a way that will perpetuate our world toward greater good and not 
you know, away from there and maybe leaders or parents who, who don't believe that their child is big enough to handle this mission. Um, and, you know, they could steer their child with a lot of warnings and don't do this and do like this. And when you're in, in this, you know, a lot, without and by the time you're done with a couple of years or generations of that type of rhetoric around this portal, you're, you're left with um, what we have today. And it's, you know, this concept of like the four minute mile. Mm -hmm. um, people are not as, we don't go to, we don't charter territories that are not average. So you, you look around you and you, you know, sex sells. It makes the world go round. There's no, there's no um, um, limit to where you're going to come across um, input on how you should conduct yourself. And the, they all, you know, all of this knowledge comes into you. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling because you would assume that when you're in your own home and the seat of your own um, privacy, that Everything is available to you, like, but you know, I've I've seen in um you know in my plant medicine, I've seen in my life that people don't like to go to areas that peop other people have not gone to. I'm trying to understand where, where you're going with this. I'm, I'm talking about in um in sexuality, in right. in intimacy between a man and a wife. There's a lot of don'ts and a lot of be careful and a lot of halachic warnings against things, and that leaves a person very very rigid and very um not in flow and not in their own power about this power. Um, I guess this is a, a very long-winded way of saying that as I learn more and more and as I'm, I guess, shown more and more, um, this, I, I've heard a woman say, um, she's been one of the, the, you know, the healers and mentors on, on my and my husband's path to harnessing the power of sexuality and restoring it um, to its, you know, to its um, place in a relationship. And she said, I don't believe in plant medicine. Everything that needs to be done can be done in, between a man and a woman in a monogamous, committed relationship. And I, when I heard her say that, I'm like, eh, okay. Like, who is she? I, I'm, I'm a year and a half in to hearing that conversation, and I would almost agree. Like, the places that this power can take you to the way it can heal you the way that a woman has power to take out energy from her husband the way a man has power to be his wife's own healer we we can access and find our like deep powers within healing powers maternal powers money like abundance powers all from this portal um because it's it's when you are most godlike right God, and um I want to try to distill what you're what you're saying into a clear, sure. coherent thought. So take your time. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of things you said. So one was that the traditionally, right? If you go back, maybe into the ideal world, this was sp spoken about, and a, a woman or a man was introduced by their father or mother. You know, a mother teaching their daughter about sexuality, yeah. a father teaching their um, son about sexuality. That has that seems to have left us. And now we've moved to, at least in, in the Chabad and the Jewish community, to teachers teaching about it in a way of a lot of don'ts. Yes. Don't do this, don't do that, which create a lot of heaviness around the subject. And instead of yeah. recognizing it for the tremendous power and creative potential and healing potential and... Um, Transcendent potential that it has yeah. we've relegated it to a list of do's and things we should be afraid of so we approach it more with fear than with anything else yeah which what sounds like you're going for is more awe than fear like this is something which is close yeah. but it's it's yeah. it's easy how that can be distorted you know one of the things that i think is important th that's what you said right yeah yeah one of the things that's important just to add to that so i've I've wrestled with it, despite the fact that I'm I do a podcast and I talk. I'm I'm not actually a very loud person or a very talkative person or a very um, or a person who who shares much. If you go to my Instagram, you won't know that much about my life other than what I put about the the podcast. Right. And the same in general, I'm not 
terribly outspoken. I'm not the one who's going to be in a social setting and go- going to be the um, the most talkative. Nevertheless, I've chosen to talk, and nevertheless, I've chosen to talk about certain subjects that a lot of people would say belong in privacy. And I agree. I agree. We should. This should be private, yeah. but it's not. Yeah. Meaning, in an ideal world, if I was creating the ideal society, then most likely I would have sex as something that was relatively private and spoken about and communicated in that way. But nowadays, and a lot of this thought went into my decision to be public about porn addiction specifically. The sex abuse was, wasn't as much of a decision. I just went in more from feeling. But as I had already done some of that and say, okay, there are things that I can say that are helpful, things that I say that I can't. And I sat on the porn addiction conversation for several years before I spoke about it. Eventually, I came to the conclusion, and it was in speaking with others as well, in one case, actually, a rabbi I look at, and um, who I often consult with on these kind of subjects. And his, his thoughts were, and I agree with, is that I'm not introducing anyone to this, right? I'm not... Right. I'm not putting them on cassettes and selling them in Judaica world right next to Avram Freed. Right. They're on YouTube. It's on Spotify. It's on Instagram. If you're in those places, you're being introduced to sexuality yeah. over there. And the first person you're bumping into is not me on the subject. No. I should, I, not if someone is exploring the conversation around sexuality, I'm not the one who's introducing them, not through these vehicles, not through these... Um, these mediums. And I think that that's a responsibility that um, we have to own for ourselves within the Jewish community is, yes, there's a lot of messaging and a lot of literature that talks about this being um, a a private conversation. And modesty is something that's real and it's important and it's integral to the Jewish community with very, very good reasons. We, we see what happens in societies when, it, when, it's, when it's not there. That being said, we aren't there so someone, the average teenager, the average even younger than a teenager, is getting introduced to these subjects, whether you like it or not. So you got to meet them there. I, I heard a statistic. Um, I think I follow this, um, you know, revolt against porn or awareness around porn on Instagram. I think it was there that I saw a quote on the number of teenagers that turn to porn for their education for sex. Um, this is, I think that's what I was trying to like um, communicate when I said you would think that in the privacy of your bedroom or, you know, you leave someone on their own and they're going to figure this out. They're going to find the power. They're going to find the beauty. They're going, but that's not what's happening. There's, you know, even in, in communities where there's not all of this um, halachic fear trying to keep you, you know, point you in a direction. And I, I actually, I'm going off on a tangent. Um, you're, you're seeing a lot of people who are lost here and who are getting hurt here and um there's there's so much there's so much goodness there's so much um healing and power that comes from this so right and i think one of the challenges also you know i don't want to speak for every single one of these the teachers um in in this space but having had having seen the way certain people speak about this publicly and then having had private conversations with them as well yeah. on the subjects, I've seen a disconnect in the way that they feel comfortable enough giving the message to the world, right. but privately one-on-one, what they say to themselves or what they'll talk to an individual about is very, very different. And for whatever reason, we've become comfortable. And a lot of people who speak publicly and who are teachers, yes, there's a difference when the microphone comes on. I probably swear a little bit less when the microphone is in front of me. You know, I don't pick up my phone when the microphone is in front of me. That can happen in regular conversation. But by and large, I want to give someone a flavor when they're listening to these public talks of the way it would be to have a conversation with me in person. You're going to hear relatively the, um, the, the same message. Right. And I feel like a lot of teachers have deviated from that and said that they're going to give a message that they feel is acceptable publicly. But if you talk to them one-on-one, you may hear, you may hear something else. So a lot of these messages around sexuality that are said, and you know, in turn, you can find a lot of things to, to support um, a position because there's a lot of rabbis, and rabbis have the tendency to argue. <laughs> so you'll find this and the opposite often said. Um, they're, they're not always geared to everyone at all times. Yeah. You know, I, I um, 
you know, when I hear you talk about like the dissonance between the way they show up and the way they speak one on one, I understand that, you know, my mature adult version, you know, brain understands that. But as someone who, you know, followed the path and um, was left to grapple with these on my own, it hurts me because there's the numbers that are going on in sex abuse and in sex addiction are are larger than anyone. You, you go to a healing space and the women there, you know, how you can just go through how many of them are healing from being abused. Right. It's in the numbers privately that, you know, in in these 12 step meetings in Crown Heights basements and, you know, and then yeah. all over the world. Like, and um, it's it, it just my younger version says, like, it's not fair. Like, I'm, I am pretty learned. I love to learn on my own, but I'm not sitting there studying the Zohars that talk about these subjects. I'm having children. I'm being there with my kids. And when I rely on you and you claim to be the transmitter of this wisdom and knowledge, but you're giving me, you know, the public, the public opinion versus the one on one. Um, I'm left with I'm left with um, out wisdom that I need. It, it would it would be nice if there if there was a way out. I don't know. But no, I think this is what it, what I'm calling to is what I think you're saying. I'm trying to draw what you're yeah. saying, and that is that some of these conversations have to happen, yeah, um, more openly, more clearly, and speak to it with a a sense yeah. of power and respect. There's no question that as a Jewish community, there has to be a reckoning around our collective relationship with sex, because, like you're saying, the amount of the amount of women that have been sexually abused. Yeah. is very high. The amount of men who've been sexually abused is pretty high. And the amount of men who are struggling with sexual addiction is astronomical. It's yeah. astronomical, and it's across the board. It's the people who've left the fold. It's the people who are still in the fold. The people struggling with sex addiction, it's, if I had to guess, over 50%. You know, this makes me think um, in my conversation with my father, you know, after, um, after we, you know, we healed a little bit around me being abused as a little girl, um, I was explaining to him that this makes perfect sense of being abused. You have a, you have a soul. It's 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 light the light of God, and it's your life force energy. You know, so long as your soul is within you, it, mm -hmm. you, you have life. Your sexuality is your life force energy. It's it's like you can almost imagine it as like your glove over that. It's or, sorry. Like over the soul. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I felt like that. It's like the closest ring around the soul. Yeah, we've spoken about this yeah. because you, you um, through sexuality, through intimacy, you create life. It's your life force, energy. It's what drives a man to get married. It's what, right, like, you know, the motivators behind certain actions. It propels you to leave a legacy. It, it makes you want to live here. Um, and w when... I was seeing it as like, this is your life force energy. This is sexual sexuality around it. When people are deprived of soul and spirit and God, they, they're, they're not bad. A lot of these predators and abusers are not bad. They are dehydrated. They are starved for spirit in, in a community that claims to be religious, that they think they have God, but they are seeking, um, they're seeking light. Why are you seeking light? Why? You, you like got why me. are you so? I want to make sure you're saying because it's a. It definitely makes you uncomfortable when you say it, but at the same point in time, um, it's good. It's a bold statement. Um, you're. You're saying that the drive for it is a positive drive. Possibly, yeah. I, I think I would own that. You know, in my in my belief that even to the abuser that abused me, I never wanted to curse him. I did. I cursed him right. plenty. You're saying, why are you so desperate for a little bit of light yeah. that you're willing to destroy a life to get some? I don't think it's so thought out that you're willing to destroy a life. I think it's just this, um, this drive. But that, there's that exchange happening, regardless of what, definitely. on a level they know this is happening. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. Right, like if someone was, dehydrated is an interesting word, right? I mean, if someone was dying of thirst, what wouldn't they do to get a little water? That's what you're saying. Yeah. So you can say they're disgusting and predators and monsters and I don't think so. evil and everything else. You're saying maybe there's a different lens to look at, that they're dehydrated. And how is it that there's someone living in a community claiming to be representative of God's way in the world and there's dehydrated people? Yeah. 
and, and especially around the youth, around teenagers who are innocently experimenting with each other, not knowing that they're literally taking and playing with a person's life and soul and spirit and, you know. Right. This is, this is what I think the biggest tragedy is, is really around teenagers when I sometimes, um, you know, I'll speak to guys 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, who find my message, reach out to me and their conversations with the Mashpia aren't getting them anywhere as it relates to what they want, what they seem to want when they reach out to me is to just get away from pornography and stop, stop watching it. And what the, the greatest tragedy to me is that they haven't been able to have real conversations around the subject. When I, I, They feel so disgusting often. And I'm like, yeah. don't you think everyone struggles with this? Like they call this, I, I think in, I'm not sure, um, in Jewish books it's referred to as chatas na'urim, the sins of our youth, mm-hmm. which suggests that everyone struggles with it and yeah maybe it's not a hundred percent of people but you know the majority is like the entirety most people struggle with this in their youth because it makes sense if you give a kid a 600 horsepower car they're likely going to get into a car accident if that's the first car they drive the first time and that's what's happening it's i think for men are different than women in this way but men when sexuality is introduced to us it's like at its peak when it's introduced it's not it doesn't ramp up it goes, it ramps down for men, right? right? So it's like a 13 years old gets this insane, insane, whatever it is at puberty, just insane sex drive. And then when they're told that this same incredible force that came out of nowhere that no one really said anything about right. is a negative thing. A, not negative. Negative would be mildly a disgusting thing. I just, I, I feel for those people. You know, when I... When I was like 14 years old or so, 15 years old, someone showed me in Shulchan Aruch where it said that um, masturbation is, is, like, is one of the worst sins. And at that point in time, I was heavily engaged in that. I, I didn't even know. I didn't, uh, for, when I first started doing it, I didn't know what it was. I just knew it felt a certain way, so I continued um, doing it. Eventually, I learned what it was, and I learned that it was a sin. And at the time, I was very, very sincere with my um, Judaism and halacha and all those things and I was so upset that I'm already like I'm already there and now I'm finding <laughs> out <laughs> yeah. that it's a problem so I was away in yeshiva and when I came back home I pulled my little brother <laughs> aside and I showed him the halacha and shulchan aruch I had pulled out the, I was, he was probably 11 or 12 at the time and it was, it was my it was one of my brother's weddings last week I was in New York and me and this brother who I introduced it to were talking about it. And he's like, I think you showed me that a little, <laughs> a little bit early. <laughs> like, All right, I think I got a little, <laughs> a little it, bit late. It shows so. you, um, you know, how much it hurt you, how you wanted to save him from the lack right. of knowledge, the, the right. sincerity in the, the, you know, what it did to you to not be told in the right way. Right. Um, it's consistent with the message, though, is that if, if you're not introducing your kids, like if a father is not talking to a son, if a mother is not talking to his daughter, someone is. And my brother, he appreciated the intention behind it, but he explained to me how, um, I don't remember why, he gave a specific example, something I didn't remember, mm. but uh, about the, something that said in Shulchan Aruch around it, and he kind of got caught up um, mm. with it. If, if I ever remember it, I'll um, repeat it on another, another discussion, but there was something in there that, impacted him and he felt like that was introduced a little bit early but it's consistent with the message that we're saying here is that assume that someone is going to deliver the message around sexuality to your kid it's not going to be um the chassan teacher or the kala teacher they're going to be cleaning up the introductions that were already made so right if right possibly make it even dirtier yeah Yeah. Uh, Um, i i also think that um you know this is all like the you know, the underbelly, the shadow of this topic. For me, um, what has been, you know, life-giving and exciting has been the awareness that as I, um, you know, take it further than being the one to deliver the knowledge to your child, my child watches me. They, they see and they, you know, they say, you're the way that you're your child's role model in your actions, mm-hmm. and much less so in your words. So, when you have a healthy um, relationship with your own sexuality in this, in this hopefully marriage or not, you know, a healthy sexuality. Um, and this is, 
you you know this power for what it is you utilize this power in a sacred way it affirms your life it affirms blessings to you um then you're this is going to be like a natural um progression you know in this child mother um transmission of sexuality i, I feel it's like I, I visited a friend of mine and my daughter something happened she couldn't get something she wanted and she she fell apart she bit me she pulled me she um and my friend who she's um one of the people like that i look up to in um how she raises her children like mm -hmm. very unusual very and she, i heard her like starting to like coach me in um how to stay calm and breathe through it and be there and i was there with my daughter you know i had just done a journey maybe a few weeks earlier and um when my daughter was like settled and you know on me um she was told me like what she had been explaining to me that she went to a, a workshop and they were giving over um, some tips and pointers on child emotions and i i was like always eager to hear i told her um since this last journey that i did like the wisdom comes from here i i am a mother in here that's like a part of my essence and until now, I've always gone to like teachers to teach my head, you know, to teach right. my brain. And then when you take away the thing that's blocking your motherhood, the thing that's blocking your your sexuality, the thing that it comes from, it comes, you know, from the inside right, it comes out. Pouring out. And it doesn't exactly. Need to There's no like you don't need to remember anything. It's embodied. It's um, it's just a natural, you know, impact from being aligned, I guess. Nice. Yeah, I was talking to someone about this uh, yesterday where. Um, he's kind of starting his healing path and you know he's done things he's done therapy and rehabs and stuff like that but it feels like the first time he's actually taking it seriously and um, as I was talking to him about different things he was like he felt like he was overwhelmed like oh there's so many things mm. I gotta worry about I'm like no it's not actually that complicated it's there's there's a lot of work ahead obviously and it's continuous I said but it's like you have to fix every single thing and no you just have to get the bad stuff out of the way and then you yeah. will shine through right yeah. it's easier than it on in some level it's easier than it than it seems we don't have to reprogram every idea we have to deprogram the bad ideas right. and then the rest flows through and, and also in my experience um there's a a, a Maimar Chazal or you know some quote that says like from God he says open for me an opening as big as a sewing needle and mm -hmm. I'll open for you an opening as wide as a banquet hall and when I when I started experiencing that in my journey in my healing space, like it was very emotional. I thought that, you know, from my childhood, I'm programming like we got to finish what we start. This world has rules to it, and nature and teva and, um, and when I um you know switched that program and I said no miracles happen. Like when Moshe Rabinu wanted to um stop one of the plagues it stopped midair it didn't have to go from i was reading on this yeah. it didn't have to go from heaven to earth moshe came and he spoke and he did what he needed to and the hail weeded you know it suspended itself and god took care of it and it was like this um this comfort and this validation of like get your feet in the right spots get yourself in the right position come at it with you your earnestness and your your why do you want to heal because you want oneness with God, this world, your husband, your children, and you'll be propelled, you'll see the signs, you'll be, our, our belief system, my belief systems um, really carried me through a lot. You know, the the last, um, one of the last prakim of my um, daily Tehillim, um, it says, had I not believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living, I wouldn't have. And it's, it's I decided that I'm going to heal, and that I'm going to um, come out victorious i went in with that and i'm coming out with that and during hard times i remind myself and, and it's it's what's you know what you fix your truth to be it becomes and we get to choose our truths wisely you know take it from there learn be inspired from from that statement and choose your truths make them your goals and walk your way to them amen amen to that yeah um is there anything else was just everything you wanted to uh to get from it or to give to it um i'll add one thing just it's on my mind um you know in response to my aunt and her before i said relative it's an aunt um and her questioning of like the selfishness of the self-centered healing that she sees oh, yeah, the younger say about that too. Go ahead. Go yeah ahead. um 
it, it definitely um, was a stumbling block in my healing for years to be fed messages from authority that this is your lot in life and therapists are bad and selfish and um, you're kind of like resigned to whatever is going on for you because it's selfish to heal and God forbid to be a selfish person. Like that's a cardinal sin in my, you know, where I come from. Um, I think that's also a message that's given to women a lot. More than men. Not to be selfish. Like any attention to self is selfish. Yeah, yeah. Mother and martyrdom are yeah. very, you know, tightly linked. There's also like assertiveness and femininity. Like you, you won't be a woman if you're going to be assertive. Like that's like the right. biggest thing you can criticize. You know, there's a lot on, on the line for a woman when you're in... In my story, my assertiveness saved my marriage. It was my phone call to you. It was my telling my husband, "I'm I'm not listening to any of the healers in this in this community that tell me that your secrets are your secrets and my secrets are my secrets. I'm gonna be stronger than them, and I'm gonna show you my heart and my wounds, and I'm gonna give you permission to show your heart to me. And that's and that's intimacy to to know and be known. Right. Um, contrary to keep your secrets on the side and um, and of, of course, there's there's a, an appropriate and um, a, a, a healthy, safe way to share your heart's pains and secrets. Uh, this is not in recovery. They say it's radical honesty, not brutal honesty. Yeah, my hu listen. My husband came at it with brutal, brutal and honesty. it was good enough because it was. Um, thank it's God. Better than lying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know, if I can go back and in hindsight, how it, you know the model version of healing, you know, in, in the real life, it's it's different, but. If I would guide people, it would be like there's a smarter way than, you know, the organic version sometimes. But, you know, coming back to my aunt and um, the messaging that I got of like, don't heal. Like mm. it's eventually I was able to put language to what I think she was saying and what I think I was saying. And, um, you know, the, the terminology of in Chassidus is of like his his hapcha and his kafia. His kafia yeah. means to hold back. His hapcha means to transform. Yes. I think that um the generation after ho the Holocaust, after you know the Russian Jews, you know, came and founded the first or second generation, um, you know, in my family, you know, in in America, in New York, um, the only way to stay alive was to not pay attention to the darkness. Right. right to fix your eyes on the prize, one foot in front of the other, soldier up, be a soldier of the Rebbe in the army of Hashem, and um, don't look left, don't look right. You have a mission, have the children, and keep going. and And look what it accomplished. There's there's an empire. There's so much goodness. There's there's an army, and it's big and it's beautiful and it's and and then in so much of Hasidus that I was raised with, I heard the message of his hapcha transform, go into the darkness, Yisrona Armin Hachoshach, reveal the light that's found in the darkness, and the light that comes from the darkness is sweeter than any light you can find here, and we're came here to transform this world and turn it over, and um, no matter where you go, no matter how dark it gets, bring the light of Hashem with you and steer it steer darkness down in the face and tell it, you know, you're a klipa, resign yourself, I know the truth. Um, and, and how many, um, how many of like the Hayom Yoms and the, the Sichos talk about the golden glory of God's creation being in, found within the body and will we'll access Mashiach through Gashmias, through the Chomer, the camel that Mashiach will ride. And um, so, in, you know, that her truth is her truth and I, I could appreciate it today. Um, it, it did a, it, 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 it enabled me to do what I do. It, it gave me the safety that I needed to be able to go into the emotional wounds of life and to, um, you know, take the path and, and broaden it and keep it alive. Right. You know, what's interesting, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I like that you put language to it. At the same time, um, the suggestion that somehow this is like not a completely Jewish way and it's a, a concession to or an influence of Western values or something. I disagree with it's. Yeah. It is the Jewish way. It's a hundred percent. There's what's true is that it could become a very selfish pursuit, and that's one of the occupational hazards uh -huh. of doing this kind of work. Is that eventually we can just be you know healing and healing and healing and healing and healing. But for, for there, but the 
the the concern of not addressing it all is obviously much larger and it leaves it to someone else to fix and yeah. most of the time as the healing sets in a, someone finds a purpose there and the purpose becomes how does the world get better from the process that i've embarked on i think you know the idea of um you know we're supposed to emulate god we are created in the image of god we are a piece of god um god is the ultimate giver and if you are healing in a truthful way, your giver mode is very activated. Um, so I, I hear the idea of like healing and healing and healing. Um, I'm sure it's real and true. Um, I'm, I'm, thank God, I'm lucky to be next to people who, whose healing um, is saving lives, literally, literally saving lives. So yeah, I, listen, I think it's the balance of the two. You know, it's said about Avram, you know, for a long time, it was messaged to me this way, but it's incorrect, is that Avram was the first person to find God. It's not true. Mm -hmm. Nech found God, Enoch found God, right? Mm -hmm. There are many people who found God in the Torah itself that it, um, mm -hmm. that it references. What was unique about Avram was that he combined the two. So it's like the, oh, wow. he was Zakin Baba Yamim. Zakin means his own work he was doing. Like he became an elder. He did his work on himself. Baba Yamim, and then he did stuff in the world, right? Like the, the days, meaning his days were filled with because we can become zakin in a day, right? We can become, like someone can live their whole life in the dark, but suddenly get a massive amount of awareness, and then they are at a certain level. Baba Yama suggests a certain, um, the world benefited, right? The days benefited oh, from wow. his work, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the reference. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's a, the Rebbe's quoting someone or it's his explanation, but that was what he combined that was unique, that he figured out how to gotten, not get lost in one versus the other. You know, yeah. it's like, yes, when we go into the work of um, just improving ourselves, it could, there is an occupational hazard, right? Which is maybe the classic Buddhist way, which mm -hmm. is detach yourself from the world, live alone on a mountain, right. be, live a minimalist lifestyle, the monk, the Buddhist, yeah. right? Completely right. detached from, from reality. And that's a way, right? There was the ascetic Jew right. up until the Baal Shem Tov, who was also popular, that one who completely divorced himself from reality. And then there's um, others who you've seen um, up close and personal in your life. I've seen up close and personal in my life. Ignore my own problems. I'm going to help the world. And Chabad influences very heavily. And the Rebbe, this was a big um, message of, of his, is go out and help and go out and service and go out and, and do those things. And th that was... Um, whether it was his actual message or the way it got um, taken, yeah, did, there yeah. certainly was a very heavy emphasis on service. Right. And that can come to the exclusion of our work. And I think the ultimate path is for them to, to be in harmony, that our work isn't, doesn't make us too detached from the world, our personal work, and that our service isn't used to distract us <laughs> from our work. Right. It makes me think of um, this week's Parsha of Yaakov and Esav um, and how what each of them represented, you know, the powers of the world, the powers of the field, the powers of money, the powers of, of, of a body, and then the power of purity and soul and God and how ultimately we're, we're all striving for this beautiful fusion. And, and that's, you know, that's right. the goal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so what she's referring to, you know, is like, I hear it but it's going to take a long time to get there. It's the equivalent of some person walking into the gym and saying, I don't know, uh, like, I don't like the look of a six pack. It'll take a long <laughs> time till you get there. Chill out. You know, yeah. Hit the gym. It's going to happen. Your muscles aren't going to, you'll still be able to bend your arms at the end. Your biceps aren't going to be that big. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> that's the same thing. Or someone, I just got an email today from someone who were going back and forth for like the last week, a bunch of questions about recovery and meetings and things and that and everything else. And he says, you know, I hear you about a meeting and everything else. I probably should go. But um, I don't, just don't get this idea of having to, to go forever. And I'm like, the only thing that's going to be forever for sure, if you don't deal with it, is your addiction. That's the forever here. Right? What's going to happen on the healing side? We have no idea. Some people go to meetings for the rest of their life. Some people don't. Some people... Recovery is definitely much more um, flexible, much more open. There's much more possible than is healing. But this guy's thinking, like his, wor his yeah. worry Concern. is right, with, with stepping into a meeting is that he's going to have to do this for the rest of his life. 
That's what we're worried about. When today you're on a path of years trying to stop for, stop porn and you can't stop it, and this is your worry. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, you know, a martyr worried about becoming selfish. Halavai. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Any uh, questions for me? No, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for shining a light in a lot of, you know, in, within um, the journey when it's been very, very dark um, for many, many blessings that you've shown us um, and pointed us towards. Thank you. Thank you.